Welcome to the Grace Point Publishing Podcast. Join us on a journey with our authors as they explain the meanings behind their message, discuss what inspires them to write, and share the many parts of their book publishing journey. And now, here's your host, co-founder and publisher of Grace Point Publishing, Michelle Vandepass. Today, I am not only honored, but thrilled to have Karen Curry Parker as my guest. She is the author of 19 books. She is a friend, a business partner, and a traveler on this planet along with me to really discern what's next, where are we going, what's happening, what are the answers to the universe, and much more. Today, I'm interviewing Karen about her book, The Quantum Human, Understanding the Evolution of Consciousness, the Solar Plexus Mutation, and Human Design. This is going to be a great interview, even if you don't know about human design yet. So welcome to the show, Karen. I'm so excited to be here talking with you. So we're going to just jump right in. Okay. For... Those who've not read this book, I read the book when it first came out, and now I'm listening to the audio book, and I'm picking up so many different things listening to the audio than I read in the book. It's interesting. But what I want to jump in and ask you is, what the heck is a solar plexus mutation? (laughs) Okay. So that's a very long answer. I'll give the short answer first, and then we can do the long answer. So the short answer is, And some of you may really feel this or sense this, even if you've never heard the words for it. We are at a time of dynamic instability on the planet. And we hit those points of dynamic instability often. If you're familiar with systems theory or you understand how things grow and evolve, you know that oftentimes before we have a surge forward in growth, We have a cycle of disorganization where it feels like things are falling apart before they get reorganized and brought back together in a new direction. The solar plexus mutation is a shift that we're in the midst of right now as we go through a period of very intense decentralization, destabilization that's pushing us towards an evolution, and I would say pushing us towards a creative revolution. When you look at where we are in terms of history and you look at where we are in terms of where we're headed on the planet and the information that we're being bombarded with, it's pretty easy to see or to guess that we're really in a state of dynamic instability. Part of what's shifting for us is the way in which we create is being forced to shift. We can't keep doing things. We can't keep creating the way we've been creating. We've been creating using models that we've outgrown. There are more people on the planet than there are resources. We can't shift the resources around in the way that we used to. And so we're being faced with a challenge. We're being faced with what feels like a crisis in a lot of different arenas. But what's really in front of us is an opportunity for us to reframe and rethink the way that we create. That's not really the easy answer, but that's the short answer. The long answer (laughs) is much longer than that. (laughs) So That's perfect because it just sort of segues into my next question, which is one of the things you talk about in the book and in the audio book, I heard it differently, which is our school system is so outdated Mm. because there are so many people. And I think you say in the book, like for 50 years who are coming in with more creative attitude toward life, a more full brain or right brained capacity to be creative in life. And yet our school system still teaches to the left brain, drives us both nuts. I know. (laughs) How do we get through or how do we change these old, outdated models that don't really fit where we are today and school being one prime example? Well, I think, again, we have to go back and look at history for a minute because the systems that we have in place were systems that were engineered basically at the end of the scientific revolution. So when the scientific revolution ended, we had a way of codifying and measuring the material world. And with that understanding of the material world, 
there emerged the scientific process, scientific methodology, and we walked away from the scientific revolution thinking, oh, we can organize everything into systems because life is reasonable and life is logical. We saw kind of at the end of the scientific revolution, the beginning of the industrial systems or an economic system that's rooted in capitalism, but it's a system, a governmental systems, education systems, healthcare systems. And these served a purpose at the time in which they emerged. They actually really lifted society up or cultures up cross globally because we've outgrown these systems or because we're in the process of breaking these systems apart because what we've seen is that the systems are finite and we're really infinitely creative. These systems are coming apart because the way in which we create is different. So what do we do? Well, nobody really likes this answer, but what we have to do is let them fall apart. What we're kind of stuck in right now is a system of band-aid repairs. We keep thinking, oh, if we'll just find this learning style or if we use this educational system, that somehow it'll fix the system when the reality is the system itself, the idea of having a system itself for things like education and even healthcare. Again, I have to be really cautious when I say this, because obviously, if we dismantle the systems that we have, we have to figure out new and innovative ways to make sure that there's equitable and just access to resources for everyone on the planet. But the way in which we've implemented it at this point in time with the idea that a human being is kind of a blank slate, that we move through a system as if we move humans through function machines, we're going to end up with a predictable and fixed result. And it doesn't work that way. People are terrible at sticking to systems and functions. That's an interesting word, blank slate. I think a lot of brand new parents feel like, oh, I got this cool little baby and I can imprint my values and ideas and thoughts and dreams and everything that they're a blank slate. And that's you (laughs) as the mom of so many. And we just know that is not true. We are not blank slates. We come with a blueprint. And that's what you talk about in human design, that that is our blueprint. Well, we come with the blueprint and we also come with our unique blueprint. So again, that makes systems difficult. How do you move people through a system if everybody in the system is different and they don't follow the formula the same way? I think this idea of an emergent way of thinking that maybe we don't have these fixed goals. I mean, I was talking recently with a mutual friend of ours, Mike Russell, who is very active in the leadership training community and does a lot of leadership facilitation for very high end corporate leaders. And He is talking about how, well, maybe not everybody leads in the same way, and maybe not everybody is even supposed to be a leader. And is that wrong, right? (laughs) That maybe that's not wrong. Maybe we're pushing people who are not really suited for leadership into leadership roles because we have this sort of systematic approach to business and management. We think you start off down at the bottom and you work your way up. Well, that's not necessarily aligned for everybody in business. And now we're looking at business as kind of being a system as well. Or in life, not everybody wants to be a leader. And just from my years of experience coaching and watching and being a mom, there are times when you can step up and be a leader in your own life when you need to be, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to be leading teams or leading business or leading in a new movement. You will find the places where you naturally lead. Does human design support my theory on that? I would say yes. And every single thing we think of as a concept right now is up for redefinition. I would even argue that the idea of what makes a leader and what is leadership is up for redefinition. So at the end of the scientific revolution, there emerged a new science, which in the late 1800s was recognized as an official science. That science is quantum physics. And quantum physics, which really is an outcropping, our scientific understanding, our spiritual understandings, our cultural understandings, our artistic understandings, these are all artifacts of shifts in consciousness. When consciousness shifts, the way in which we understand the world shifts. And so scientific revolution was really a result of the idea that we could gain more sovereignty and control over our lives. Quantum physics basically was an outcropping of an even bigger leap in that idea that we could have control over our lives. Quantum physics really came as a result of a shift in consciousness that basically said, hey, 
your thoughts, your perceptions, your expectations, the stories you tell about who you are actually create your reality. And when we started to look at the idea that the way you be creates your life, basically, and then we start taking that idea, and we've been really thinking about this idea very heavily in the last 120 years. We saw a huge new thought movement that emerged once quantum physics was classified as an official science and quantum physicists started to say, hey, you know, the building blocks of matter don't actually behave the way that matter does. And so maybe matter isn't actually behaving the way that we think it behaves. And then we saw the emergence of Charles and Myrtle Fillmore and Unity Church. We saw Ernest Holmes and Science of Mind. We had Napoleon Hill writing books about think and grow rich. And we started to realize that maybe our perception is part of what creates reality and that Maybe our reality is a result of our energetic frequencies from the stories that we're telling. And so bringing that back to leadership, we think of leadership as this thing we seize or we take or we usurp. Or when you say the word leader, oftentimes we think of the general, right? Or somebody that's really working hard to lead the people. When in fact, when we look at leadership, particularly look at leadership through the lens of human design, we see that leadership happens when we organize ourselves energetically, when the timing is right, around making movements, unifying people around convictions that create sustainability in the world. That leadership happens as a result of having faith and really believing that you are enough because that belief in your own enoughness creates a resonance field, an energy field, And when we occupy that energy field fully, then people follow us, not because we're leading in the way that we think of as leading, but because our energy starts to create organization that's coherent, that's cohesive, that moves people towards higher states of organization and evolution. And it's not really anything you have to do. And that's a really hard shift for us to keep making with our brains, because we're so deeply entrained that If you want to make something happen, you got to go do it. And of course, there's always going to be the doing part, unless we get out of the third dimension completely. The third dimension is a doing dimension, but you don't do what you have to do until the energy is aligned. And then the doing is just a natural outflow of the energy itself. You be the whatever it is you're creating, and then the right next step reveals itself. And it's just a very different way of thinking about leadership. You mentioned right timing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see if I can pull together a thread here, but I've been thinking about this and I know you're going to be able to pull this together for me in a thread. Right timing is difficult to tap into when you're not aligned with yourself and if you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are in burnout. Mm -hmm. And you Mm -hmm. and I were at a mastermind and had a great discussion about rest. Mm -hmm. And then I heard... The five kinds of integrity that are rooted, I guess, in gate 26, if I'm quoting you correctly. You are. (laughs) Physical, resource, identity, moral, and energetic integrity. And it feels to me like there is some connection between being exhausted, the different kinds of rest, and integrity. And I haven't been able to pull that all together in my brain yet. Uh What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, so it actually all starts with self-worth. Because when we value ourselves, we value ourselves and our role that we play in the world, because we each play a unique and vital and irreplaceable role in the cosmic plan, we value ourselves and we value our role enough to take care of ourselves. And part of taking care of ourselves is including rest. We are designed literally to rest as a key element of sustainability. But again, going back to the idea that the scientific revolution gave us this idea that we could measure everything. At the end of the scientific revolution, we learned to measure value with numbers. And part of what happened is we started to gauge our value in the world with numbers. And we started to say, My value is tied to how many numbers I create. And in particular, we started to translate that to money. And so we started valuing ourselves based on how much money we had, how much effort and how much hard work we put into something. And that metric around hard work and money and 
the idea that if you want to make money, you have to work. And if you want to make more money, you have to work harder. And the harder you work, the more value you have, because the more money you'll make started us in this hundred year long chasing after this never ending equation. What happened is, of course, if you're going to work harder to make more money at a certain point in time, you run out of time in your week. And so now you end up working all the time. And of course, as you work all the time, you're not sustainable. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is a lot of us have learned that we can't make money doing what we love or being who we are because we're told these are the things that you have to do to make money. And if you do anything that's not on this list, then whatever you do is not valuable. So if you long to be an artist, say, or a writer, and you have a belief and you've been told, oh, you'll never make money doing that, then we don't pursue the things that are right for us to pursue those full expressions of our authentic selves. And we compromise and we do things that we think we have to do for money. Because again, there's a whole big mess around who you are, how valuable you are, and what you create in the world is tied to the numbers you generate. So there's a really strong relationship between overworking or misaligned working, money and self-worth, and of course, consequently rest. And what we see is that when people do work in the world and overwork in the world as an attempt to prove their value or because they think this is the only way they can create value in the world, they get out of integrity. They get out of, as you said, physical integrity. Their bodies literally burn out. They get out of resource integrity. They misuse their money or they misuse their physical resources or they try to use resources to prove their value. They get out of identity integrity, meaning they stop being who they are or they don't even believe they can be who they are. They get out of moral integrity because we think, what else are we going to do if we're already overworking and we can't make any more money? We're going to probably have to devolve to sketchy ways of making money because we can't do it in a moral way. And of course, we overcommit energy we don't have. The thing that's really interesting is that that energy for the gate 26 where integrity lives is also where the thymus lives. So it impacts our immune system. And if you look at the physical effects of burnout, And the medical costs that burnout costs us across the board every year, it's billions of dollars that are really the true cost, if you will, in the systems that take care of us that are the result of an entire collective group of people not working well, not working correctly, not resting, not being valued for resting and not doing what they came here to do. The simple answer to that is anytime you internalize the story that it's not okay for you to be who you are and how you are in the world. We experience that basically as trauma and oftentimes just the energy that it takes to maintain the facade of being someone you're not is exhausting and creates burnout. And so we have to have to have to right now, this is really what's up for the world. We have to heal the karma of self-worth and we have to redefine value and we have to stop using money, especially, and any kind of number as a metric of the value of a human being. People are valuable because they exist. All living things are valuable because they exist. And when we can start shifting that definition around value, it's going to change the entire basis upon which we make decisions for the future of the world. You have a great card deck. Thank you. The Quantum Human Design Activation Cards. And I just pulled a card while you were talking, and guess what I pulled? (laughs) Well, don't guess. I'll tell you. Okay. (laughs) Gate 59, sustainability. Mm, mm -hmm. That just goes right along with everything we've been talking about today. Rest, integrity, be who you are, being a leader. All of this must lead to us being sustainable in our lives because otherwise we're going through individually these incredibly intense times of go, 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 burn out. Mm -hmm. And there's no sustainability there. As you say, then we get sick or we're just exhausted. But the earth is like that right now. The earth is in these intense cycles of just feels like a roller coaster. And it feels like not just in the last few years, but the last decade, it's gotten more intense. Mm -hmm. How can we use the evolution of consciousness, the solar plexus mutation and human design to help us all live in a more sustainable society? The answer is actually pretty simple, or at least I would say the first step is really simple. It's just, we tend to resist it. The first step is we have to each individually heal our self-worth because 
if we don't individually live sustainably, none of us is going to be making sustainable choices. So I recently just moved out of the city into the country. And one of the things we had in the city was Grubhub, right? (laughs) So we could order whatever we wanted and it would come to the door. We don't have that out here, which is actually a really, really good thing. I'm liking that we don't have it out here because part of what was happening is that at the end of the day, when I was tired and dinner needed to be prepared, I was not making sustainable choices around dinner. I would just go online, order some food. And then at the doorstep, there would come probably about 800 styrofoam containers filled with all kinds of plastic and whatever else. And that's not even considering how much money we were spending. We were throwing out so much plastic and styrofoam just from ordering out. And of course, the only reason I was ordering out in the first place, not making good sustainable choices was because at the end of the day, I was tired. When we have energy, when we ourselves are sustainable, we take care of ourselves, when we rest, when we value ourselves well, the basis, the baseline from which we make decisions changes. And now we can do what I might say more challenging things, make more challenging decisions or more challenging commitments because we have the energy to sustain the commitment. It takes a certain amount of a decision and a commitment to use energy differently, to engage in relationships differently, to make a different set of economic choices. And if we're all flopping around, burned out, and just making in the moment reactionary decisions, we run the risk of running the planet into the ground. We all want to do something. As I said, we are so deeply conditioned to do. Even resting is like, well, what are we going to do to rest? You don't do anything to rest. You don't You don't do anything to rest, right? We are so conditioned that what are we going to do to save the world? Well, I think we have to take a step back and say, how do we need to be to save the world? And if we be sustainable, we cultivate a high quality, high frequency sense of personal self-worth. When we live from that place, there's no lack. And now all of a sudden, when we look at the world, we're making sustainable, abundant decisions and we're making good decisions that are rooted in enoughness, not only for ourselves, but for each other, because now we're no longer in competition with each other. There's no, I got to get my fair share driving the whole show. When we are enough, there is enough. And when there is enough, we're creating even more. And we're able to take the enoughness that we have and help others create enough as well. Here's what I think I heard you say, Karen, that number one, Because everything you've said just has kept coming back to this. We have to heal our own Mm self-worth. I think what that means is honoring when we need to rest, how we need to rest. Being able to honor our own decision-making process. And I would interpret that as not being bullied into saying yes right away or no right away or following someone else's timeline. Mm -hmm. Because you talk about right timing for us. So that's partly when to say no, when to say yes, how to rest, how to follow your own internal promptings to write or be creative or be in the world that may have some doing associated with it, but not necessarily doing for the purpose of making something or making money or having numbers or ending up with a final product. Are those examples of how to heal your own self-worth? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the only other piece that I would add to that is that when you really get your value, then not following that path that is yours to follow becomes non-negotiable. And it's almost not even personal. It's just this is life's intelligence evolving through you and the unique role that you play. And you just do what you came here to do, and you don't question it. My guest today has been Karen Curry Parker, author of 19 books around human design. Today, we're talking about the quantum human, understanding the evolution of consciousness, the solar plexus mutation, and human design. You can get it, of course, on paperback and ebook, but Audible is where I'm enjoying it right now. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Karen. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Grace Point Publishing Authors Podcast. We can't wait to talk more next time as we introduce you to another one of our amazing authors.
make sure you hit subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss a single episode of the Grace Point Publishing Authors Podcast. To find out more about our authors and to see how we can help you publish your book, head to gracepointpublishing.com. Keep writing. Keep creating. Your words matter.